The true history of humanity revealed. Oh no. The history of mankind as it is written in books is wrong. I already know from the music that this is gonna be stressful. Shit. They blew up a nuke in Egypt. Bets are open. I'm betting aliens. Aliens and like Earth magnetic magic. I would like is this conspiracy theory shit? I hope so. For translating the film if this is some actual archaeology, I, I love Egypt and archaeology, but I want to see aliens. Here is Egypt, Cairo, and the Giza Plateau with three large pyramids, those of Khufu, Khafre, and Menkor. The Pyramid of Khufu was covered with white limestone, which is completely missing today. There are smaller pyramids called satellites, temples of which only ruins remain, and sanctuary tombs called mastabas, and below, the monumental statue of the Sphinx and the Valley Temple. Inside the Great Pyramid, there are two corridors, tunnels, one chamber 30 meters underground, a room in the middle called the Queen's Chamber, an upper room called the King's Chamber, a large inclined gallery, and four shafts which cross the pyramid. But what is exceptional and out of the ordinary? You are at the foot of the pyramid to take a photo. Stop for a moment to think a little. Imagine pushing and pulling a stone this size with 50 other people. Then imagine doing this with a second stone, then a third. You will have to raise them to a height of 5 meters, then 10, then 20, 40, 80, 120 meters. There are 2,300,000 waiting for you like this that will need to be transported and hoisted. It's dizzying. You look to the top, then to the bottom, and you start to reflect. Immediately the thought comes to mind, the Egyptians were crazy. Uh huh. You then learn that a block of granite weighs 70 tons, the weight of three loaded tractor trailer trucks. Then you learn that inside there are 1,500 tons of granite that came from 900 kilometers away. A kind of dizziness takes you. You've only just begun to consider the difficulty and you are forced to humbly recognize that the mystery of the pyramids is not exaggerated. Here are the theories. For Egyptologists, it was the Egyptians who built the pyramid, period. They achieved the following feats. They raised and leveled a hill to place the pyramid and a hundred mastabas. From the beginning of the plateau to the end, 250 meters, the base of the pyramids is perfectly horizontal to within 21 millimeters. Yep, they dug an 80 meter long tunnel that descends to a depth of 80 meters into the rock, which is 1.1 meters wide by one meter high with an error of only one centimeter from beginning to end. Here is a tunnel of our time. They cut and transported oh. around 130 blocks of granite Dude! It's a fucking mine shaft. It's not a tunnel of our time. It's a mine shaft. They don't give a shit about making the walls smooth. This is so dumb. They cut and transported around 130 blocks of granite weighing 12 to 70 tons from Aswan. And they raised them 80 meters high. The pyramid is not built with four sides, but with eight sides in a concave apothem. The pyramid is oriented to the north with an error of 0 0.05 degrees. According to Egyptologists, the construction has been lasted lost, about yeah. 20 years, meaning one block was cut and transported and installed every three minutes. It is impossible to pass a sheet of... Wait, 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 wait. According to Egyptologists, the I'm construction lasted about 20 shit. years. So, 20 years, 20 times, 365 days. 7,300 days times 24, 175,200 hours times 60, 10,512,000 minutes. That's, then we, wait, 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 let's scrap those calculations. Let's assume they are only working 12 hours a day. So go back to 7,300 days times 12 times 60. That's one block 
more than one block per three minutes. Anyways. It was cut and transported and installed every three minutes. It is impossible to pass a sheet of paper between the blocks. How does one explain that these blocks weighing several tons were cut with such precision? This was the copper era, and logically the construction had to be carried out with a copper chisel and a stone ball. This is the academic's theory. Let's continue with other prowesses in precision. The downward tunnel forms an angle of 26.2 degrees. This angle is identical in the ascending corridor. A student's protractor does not display the two-tenths of a degree. But the most impressive remains to come with the south underground tunnel and the well shaft 30 meters underground. At first glance, they are ordinary tunnels. The entrance is 79 centimeters high and ends 16 meters further with a difference of only five centimeters. It's 75 centimeters wide at one end and 76 centimeters at the other end, a difference of one centimeter and almost this perfectly wall's straight line. Like technology. How does one build this tunnel with such precision underground? It's the Egyptians went even further in their exploits. The well shaft starts near the underground chamber, rises almost vertically 10 meters, to then continue 26 meters with an angle of 45 it's degrees, nam, nam, nam time. with perfect dimensions, hey, 68 by 68 centimeters. Mm -hmm. yeah, but the real thinks, curious thing is why did they leave ugly 3D models of people inside those shafts? That the well shaft was dug by thieves from the bottom to the top shortly after the funeral. So then thieves would have taken the time to dig a perfectly straight tunnel? The notches for placing the feet are much too small for a worker to be able to stand a long time without a rope digging above his head. To dig these three tunnels and the underground chamber, you must solve four problems. They use the you template. Light, a solution for making precise measurements and hard tools for digging, correct mm. working conditions, and above all, a solution for removing the carbon dioxide. The biggest problem is indeed the CO2. When a worker works, he exhales CO2. This CO2 accumulates at the bottom. After one hour, there are 15 centimeters. Two hours later, 30. It is a sure death if he does not go out at once. If this CO2 is not removed, it remains there for several weeks. Here, I will demonstrate how the CO2 flows in the gallery. It stays at the bottom. So, I take a gas that has the same density as CO2. It has the property of being... Look, actually it's PPP gas. ...in colored, allowing it to be seen, but it's a gas, so we see through it. And so now we move away a little bit, and I'm going to pour the CO2 here in this jar, and we'll see what happens. And we see that the gas that represents CO2 remains at the bottom of this crystallizer. Uh, this is a jar. And that also shows that O2 oxygen will also fall by gravity to the bottom of the tunnel. CO2 isn't even the deadly stuff, In other it's all words, the ocean. I mean, you, you, can, you can die of CO2 poisoning, like having... Oh yeah, 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 like radon and other shit, but that's more long-term as well. Like the radon emitted by granite, that, that'll, that'll kill you, but that'll kill you slowly, no? But I, I, I get the point of like, if you're sitting in a tight tunnel and working and whatnot, you're, you're gonna suffocate on CO2 if it's not properly aerated. But this is not the right example to show for that. Damn sure, glad they got a professor to explain this. He's yeah, so fucking dumb. What's this? This is a movie called Great Pyramid K 2019 by director Femi Krasniki. And I'm pretty sure at some point, and we're, we're just waiting for that point, I'm pretty sure at some point they're gonna start talking about aliens. That's, that's all I'm waiting for. CO2 won't be enough to kill you when there's all that other space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like what he's showing that CO2 is, uh, is heavier than air means it can't actually fill in the the tunnel they were showing right because it'll even if there's very little airflow it'll flow out the end the, this example is dumb because it's a fucking bull of course something heavy stays in the bull anyways the tunnel with my assumption from the bottom up because the oxygen would not go up oh it's not false though considering they're in the basement so that's actually true without proper um aeration the the basement would fill with co2 that's actually that's actually a fair point. Proper airflow is a problem in, in modern mine shafts. It's, it's, that's, not, uh, that's not insane. The pyramids are spaceships that landed here. Every year it's a different species of alien building the pyramids. I, we don't yet know if it's, an ancient, if it's an ancient alien theory. We, we don't yet know what the theory is. Right now they're still in the phase where they, they're saying that Egyptologists know fuck all. And that a they're wrong about everything they know. A worker will exhale 40 grams of CO2 in one hour. 
And chemistry explains that 40 that's, grams that's of the game. CO2 we're, we're, are fixed the, by 100 grams. The bets are open as to what the fuck is going to be the the actual the actual uh, meme of this video. There's going to be a meme. There has to be a meme, but we don't know what it's going to be. Of limestone. So, uh, almost four hours. I'm going to sleep this in 30 minutes. Is you know, we, we're not going to watch it entirely. Don't worry. Egypt, let's, let's in this experiment, I want to show that CO2, which is in the atmosphere of this beaker, is fixed by limestone, that is, limestone chalk. I put a little powder here in the water, which is there, which I will shake in a moment. This is just a level that allows you to see if there is CO2 consumption in the air. So, I set the level to zero, and here we go. I put the chalk in. And now when I agitate, we will look at the index here. We see that the index shows that there is CO2, which is fixed by limestone. Oh, shit. So they actually had a CO2 filtration limestone method. Limestone has the property of fixing CO2 when it is wet. And that's a rather simple explanation, because there is water present, or we can bring it. And then the limestone, which was excavated, yes, is raised to the surface with the CO2 which was fixed to it. Suppose they solved, one doesn't know how, the problem of light, the tool to measure precisely, and the hard tool for digging, that they have found the way to evacuate the CO2. The problem remains that it is technically impossible to dig towards the bottom. It would take an arm two meters long to reach the bottom. If one can provide some theories on the construction of the pyramids and on the way the stones were raised to 80 and 140 meters, here there is no explanation. We're totally in the dark, and it doesn't stop there. I need to see that again. Here is the part due to... Uh... We're to a if bottom. <laughs> the problem remains that it is technically impossible. This is... <laughs> this is like that meme with the headache. And then the like the fucking entire body becomes red in the last one. Oh no! Hence uh, aliens. Imagine, imagine if you could also I, just okay, just for a second. Imagine you're in a tunnel, and instead of like crawling down like this, you actually go down with your head downwards. So your arms are in front of you, and then you can actually dig like in front of you. Imagine that technology. I, I know maybe maybe ancient Egyptians did not have that technology. Obviously, only aliens could explain to human beings that you need to like to reach in this tunnel. You need to go in the face down and probably have like so, a, a rope attached to your legs so people can pull you back up or, or something. Huh. Interesting, huh? It seems like we were about to get some product drop. To yeah. dig towards the bottom. It would take an arm two meters long to reach the bottom. If one can provide some theories on the construction of the pyramids and on the way the stones were raised to 80 and 140 meters. Here, there is no explanation. Maybe they had chimpanzees digging. We're totally yes. in the dark. And it doesn't stop there. Here is the Part Dieu Tower in Lyon, nicknamed the Crayon. A tower that a ends with a pyramid on top. <laughs> the last floor is 144 meters high, equivalent to the height of Khufu Pyramid. The two shafts of the middle chamber arrive 80.72 meters for one and 80.73 meters for the other, an error of one centimeter over a total distance of 100 meters. How did the Egyptians achieve such precision? With this? The official theory says that these four shafts... With this? She says in a dismissive voice. Ugh, those tools? Disgusting. And you'd have a rope, and they'd probably have a device out of wood to lessen the effective angle so you were more horizontal. True. Well, maybe not, because they well, they managed to dig the tunnels very straight, with very, uh, a very small margin of error, so I don't know. Gibbons have the gibbons have the late, longest arms relative to body size of any primate. The F1 drivers of the canopy world, they can swing over a distance of 10 meters or more. Nice conduits to guide the soul of the king. For others, they are air shafts, or star target shafts, or even shafts to fill with water. Okay, but these shafts are sealed shut, Everyone and those in the middle chamber were sealed on both True. sides until 1872. Yet Egyptologists insist. In 2013, at the edge of the Red Sea, a papyrus was discovered. Mehrer's Papyrus, the captain's diary, which dates from the time of Khufu. It is the oldest papyrus ever discovered. A documentary film was produced and broadcast on television. This film is an interpretation, fictional and far from being scientific reality. In the film, in theory, the workers quarry the block with copper pickaxes. 
In truth, the extras in the film detach the stone with steel pickaxes. With copper pickaxes, it would require 10 years of effort for this block to come off. Finally, they detach a three-ton block. In this papyrus, there is no mention of the size of the stone transported by Merer. It could weigh 10 kilograms or 10 tons. Three tons is a very small stone in Egypt. The boat, reconstructed with care and fidelity, almost sank with the block. Even <laughs> removing one ton, the boat struggled to bear the weight. It risked capsizing at any time. Fictional and far from scientific How reality. do you transport like this stone, document. which weighs 10 tons, I'm... from the original quarry hey. site? Obviously, the people who made this document, uh, documentary know very, very well how to make something fictional and far from the scientific reality. With which boat? They are experts. Later, the film shows 40 men struggling to pull the stone weighing two tons from the port to the site. Here, the ramp is as monumental as the pyramid itself. This ramp is copied in the Hollywood film 10,000 BC. Hollywood also adds mammoths. One sees nasty Egyptians mistreating mammoths, pulling blocks of stones. Of course, no traces of Why mammoths or of the ramp were ever found. The ramp alone is a monumental work, whose dismantling should have left traces. This site, as seen by Jean-Pierre Houdin, would require hundreds of thousands of workers. In his 3D animation of the documentary, one can see that the Egyptians are struggling to hoist and lay the stones every three minutes. And there are other inconsistencies in this theory. 600 men pull a 60-ton block of granite, the equivalent of 100 kilograms per person. 50 kilograms per person is more realistic, therefore 1,200 men would be necessary to pull this block. Otherwise, the workers would collapse. And if indeed they can transport a 60-ton block, how would they do with this 360-ton block of Aswan granite? How many people are needed? So I had a friend who was really into conspiracy theories. His theory was that uh, you could actually... He, he'd watched a video about it, so it's like a very... He, he knows everything about this. Apparently, you know how there's magnetic waves around the Earth? There's points of energy, there's ley lines of energy. So like geomancers could magnetize the stones and float them from the quarry to the temples they're building, by the way. No, not not aliens. I'm talking about m wizards. Okay, <laughs> who needs who needs aliens when you have wizards? Seven thousand two hundred men. Jean Pierre Adam, another Egyptologist, takes the absurdity even further. These are the oxen who pulled the stone block, and I suppose this monolith too. This is just the base of the statue of Ramses. The theories imply one must also bring this monolith from the other side of the Nile. Two hundred. To be fair. I mean, okay, as, as much as this movie is probably going to be like really ridiculous, continued being really ridiculous. I, not aliens, you moron. I'm talking serious wizardry here. I heard that shit too. We lost our superpowers to move big stones. Yeah. All these wrong Egyptologists are French. Coincidence? It's not a coincidence. France, uh, because Napoleon invaded uh, Egypt, France has uh, been leading um, Egyptology as, a, as an academic effort. Uh, uh, traditionally speaking, at least. That, uh, like, if you go to the Louvre, uh, half the fucking Louvre is a bunch of stolen e e Egyptian shit. No, I think the French just love being wrong. Okay, sure. Um, no, you know, to be fair, just to, like, put things into perspective, Egyptologists don't know how the fuck they moved, like, 360-ton blocks. Those are actual mysteries. And it's perfectly fine to wonder about how, like, how the fuck they were moved. No, no, no theories we have right now makes sense. The Louvre even has a pyramid, it does. Oh, and friendly, friendly reminder, uh, any, anyone who tells you colonialism doesn't exist anymore, friendly, friendly reminder that when Egypt asked, for, asked France for um, its artifacts and uh, historical things back, France replies to Egypt, oh, but we will take better care of them uh, than you would, so we, we should keep them. And as if 360 <laughs> tons is not... <laughs> Pyramids are only a mystery because we put the French on it. Oh no, they were just built different. Enough. There is also the Aswan obelisk, 1,200 tons of granite, which awaits them. Here is the kind of crane and how many it would take to lift it. According to Jean-Pierre Adam, it would take 12,000 men or 8 to 9,000 oxen. <laughs> For the fucking Benny Hill music, dude. 
It is no longer fiction, but science fiction, or a cartoon, however you like. Personally, I prefer the theory of the aliens who would have transported them thanks to their superior technology. The Egyptologists Wait a second. Us with a dupe. They don't actually believe in the aliens? They just made fun of the alien theory. Oh no. Well, what is going to be their theory then? I mean, are they wrong? When is the last time someone cleaned the pyramids? They're sandy and shit. Obvious explanation. After all the hard work to cut this obelisk, the workers realized that it was too heavy and, and it was cracked. So they just left it. Well, 1,200 tons of granite is still not enough. We come to the Pyramid of Menkor, whose exterior was covered with the staggering quantity of 103,000 tons of granite. Just printing millions of books showing workers dragging stones does not mean that it is a scientific reality or the truth. There is a problem with the granite. In 1920, the Egyptologist Engelbach published a book on the Aswan obelisk. Finding no trace of pickaxe or chisel on the obelisk, he theorized that the dolerite balls that were all around were the tools used. Egyptologists have since approved and adopted this idea. Egyptologists have a lot of humor and finesse. Whenever they find an object next to a monument, they claim that it is the tool used to create it. <laughs> Gold landed what would you have to yeah. say if they had found a spoon? This is actually a, this is actually a three hour and thirty minute diss track on the Egyptologists. They don't have a theory. They're not going to have a single. They 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 just they don't give a shit. This this is just a shit on Egyptologists. I feel like that's all this is going to be. Without having too much knowledge in physics, we know that two materials with the same property will repel each other. When you hit granite the dolerite ball bounces. So, if you were wondering what type of tool was able to carve such a big obelisk in granite, well, I have the answer for all of you little curious minds. Here are the tools. Listen, it seemed absurd to me too when I was told that, but the tools they used were only balls of a stone called dolerite, which form, my God, it is hot, which form naturally in the region. They weigh on average five kilos, and the method is relatively simple. You take a ball, you hit like a lunatic on the granite, and you see what happens. Following experiments, it was estimated that it was possible to wear away five millimeters of the surface of the granite in one hour. That's enough to tell you that you must have good arms, and especially a lot of patience. I am not entirely convinced by the Two tools, times, yeah. because we're here just having fun tapping. We see after ten strokes we have a just scratch the granite, but the thing is that with this ball, they did that behind. Forty meters long and 1,200 tons, voila! Granite is one of the hardest stones on earth. 7 out of 10 on the most scale of mineral hardness. Nowadays, granite is only cut using a diamond tooth saw, cooled with water, and in a straight line. In official documentaries, we are shown experiments where granite is cut with a copper saw and sand. They managed to cut in a straight line and take out a cylindrical core. <laughs> Everything can be explained with words, but how do you cut this gabbro vase, a material even harder than granite, in 3500 BC? Or this tracheandesite vase? No fewer than 35,000 vases like these have been found in Saqqara. How in 1800 BC does one achieve these curves in the statue of Senusret, made of migmatite, stone of hardness 7? Or that of the statue of Menkor and her princesses, in grey which is harder than granite? And this nice vase only 3 millimeters thick? Or the famous Sabu disc made of schist? What is this extraordinary tool that made of granite schist? Like or maybe 4,500 years ago, granite was soft like clay? These observations pose fundamental problems. We are told that the limestone rafters are vaulted to distribute weight. Why they- <laughs> seven, out of 7 out of 10 would demolish with my balls. The problem is that if you drop it, they would roll away. Round is a bad shape for a tool. Absolutely, yeah. Round is a really dumb shape for a tool. Also, check DM. Oh, yeah, that's actually- That actually makes sense, yeah. Or earlier when we were talking the tunnel, like a wooden frame to hold the shoulders, yeah. And that would be open to allow them to work. Absolutely, with the ropes to hold them back there, yeah. Then is the ceiling of the underground chamber not vaulted. However, it must support all this rock mass in addition to the pyramid itself. Is that science? In the absence of a rational and is that science? today, we have all kinds of theories ranging from perplexing to surreal, and still without proof. This is the case with this documentary and many others. The documentaries suggest that either extraterrestrials built the pyramids or a lost civilization, the Atlanteans, or both together, hand in hand. The Atlanteans lived on Uber. Earth and had assimilated great technological knowledge. Fucking mages. I knew it. I knew we were gonna... Okay, I actually called aliens earlier, to be fair. I wasn't expecting wizards. Following abrupt climate change or a natural disaster, they and Atlantis disappeared 10,000 years ago without a trace. In short, the only traces they left were the pyramids. Then the Egyptians arrived, found them very beautiful, and decided to maintain them. This is what Graham Hancock and many others think.
Their civilization was not a development, it was a legacy. They came to Egypt and they brought the gifts of civilization. Is her nipple a out? A very logical no. theory. Since to cut it's not. She's just wearing a very, like very, this, very thin bikini. Which means you need electricity, a power plant, steel machinery, engineers, schools, and universities. In short, 5,000 years of technical and scientific evolution. Concerning the construction of the pyramids, they do not advance any scientific explanation. They unanimously agree these are not tombs. According to them, the Atlanteans or some other unknown ancient builders cut these stones with machines and then built whatever they wanted. Then they left these machines to the Egyptians, who used them to make statues, the and battles, mage, marriages, births, etc. in hieroglyphics. Finally, the Egyptians destroyed all these True. tools without leaving a trace. After building the pyramids, the Atlanteans entrusted cleaning and maintenance to the Egyptians. Some believe that the pyramid was a hydraulic instrument, but we do not know for what purpose. For others, the pyramid is a receiver transmitter to connect with other worlds in the universe, and the sarcophagus yes. a device to lengthen life. Lie down in the sarcophagus a few hours and recharge yourself for a hundred more years. For Chris <laughs> Dunn, the pyramid of Khufu is an energy plant using waves and magnetic resonances, anti-gravitational systems, affirmations supported with numerous conferences, presentations and trips throughout the world. In this nebulous realm, the artists also have their say, further thickening the mystery. But the aliens and the Atlanteans left no traces or materials. No iron, no steel, no crystal, this no plastic, no Paz metals Champ. or composite materials. Only stones. Strange, isn't it? We are still waiting to see the aliens on the evening news of the major channels filmed in Egypt. We could have pyramids in chat right now. How are we supposed to bury Dash properly? True. HD. At present, there is no tower. evidence of ultra-developed civilization. Yo, conspiracy theorists love Tesla. Like, the, the Tesla towers and Tesla's inventions and everything. If, if you listen to some people, Tesla, like, invented cold fusion. And it's been, ta it's been kept away from us because of, like, big energy and some kind of conspiracy. ...or aliens before the Egyptians. In short, an incredible mixture. We are lost in confusion. One more for the road. If we divide the width of the pyramid by half the height, we get pi, 3.14. The golden <laughs> ratio and pi are also found in the king's chamber. The facts are there, and anyone can verify them on site or with official documents. These two figures and many others are universal constants. Universal constants are the insurmountable borders of our reality, kind of like the rules of a game. Officially, pi was discovered by Archimedes like around 287 BC. It's just a coincidence, cry Egyptologists. It's intentional, insists Jacques Grimaud. Rainer Stadelman found a pyramidion in Dakor, which measures 100 centimeters high. The Egyptologists are unanimous. It is by chance there, too. The metric unit was found in the Great Pyramid, especially in the upper chamber. In 1952, Dr. Funk Hellet published a proposal that the Great Pyramid, which had an upper chamber... Dr. Funk Hellet? Oh, shit. ...which was a double square on the floor, had a perimeter of 60 cubits, or 10 times the number pi, in meters. This is the first time the metric unit was proposed as a measure used by the Egyptians in addition to the royal cubit. Instead of looking to the heavens, staring at the stars and imagining aliens, we just had to look down, right under our feet, on the ground. This is what Joseph Davidovitz did. <laughs> <Here. laughs> just, just look at the ground and the face of this guy appears. <laughs> Inside the ground. The mole people, lizards, <clears throat> aliens build all around things. And the area can be calculated with pi aliens. I just love that. It's like, look at the ground and you'll find the answer and the face of this fucking guy appears. Looked mineralogist and Egyptologist. In fact, it is a matter of chemistry and minerals. Here is a simple wooden mold. We mix flaky limestone with white clay called kaolin. Caustic soda is dissolved in water. We mix everything together with a little water. This gives a kind of paste. We pour it into the mold. A few hours later, the paste begins to harden. The minerals bind together thanks to the chemical reaction, which after 30 days gives a real white stone, hard as the covering stones of the pyramid. It is the first concrete of humanity. Today, concrete is a common material, ordinary, but at that time, this mixture was noble and expensive. Sodium carbonate comes from natron, a region of Egypt, hence the symbol in chemistry of sodium Na for natron. Burnt lime is made by heating limestone. When you mix the burnt lime with the sodium carbonate, caustic soda is produced. Kaolin clay is naturally present in limestone in Egypt. This clay limestone is abundant. There are millions of cubic meters. The components are mixed with water and poured into wooden molds. This is how the Egyptians made all the stones. Joseph Davidovitz made this discovery in 1989. At the time, he assumed that the stones were molded and poured on site and not cut. He called this process geopolymer. The principle is the same as that of concrete today. Modern cement is made of clay heated at 1,450 okay, degrees. Okay, first off. This is way more boring and realistic than what I was expecting. I wanted a real juicy conspiracy theory. And secondly, if this is true, how come we never heard of it? I, can't you like really easily check the chemical composition of the blocks surrounding the pyramids? That, that seems like really easy. You just scrape a bit off, and if it's the same chemical composition as this thing, then you got it. It's, it's that, right? Celsius mixed with water and gravel, producing concrete. 
I'm the ancients to used natron and burnt lime instead of granite. granite is keeping this mixture of natron, burnt lime, clay, and limestone at room temperature and in the open air <laughs> is the same result as modern matrix. concrete. This is geopolymer concrete. The proof is everywhere in thousands of examples. The proof Rhomboid is everywhere. Pyramid seems to come out of a mold. The quality of the concrete is excellent. Davidovitz interprets the texts of the Colossi of Memnon differently from the official interpretation. He thinks they mean the concrete was mixed like dough, not the poetic version. They were made like bread, full of love. Indeed, the material is a very complex chemical mixture of silicious paste. Joseph Davidovitz's theory was refuted and relegated to the background for lack of scientific evidence. Years later, he brought the evidence with chemical analyses. Even with very detailed analyses, the chemical difference between a poured stone, artificial, and a natural stone is almost imperceptible. The result is the same, and it is for this reason that geologists saw nothing. He continued the debate, but Egyptologists are still not convinced, or rather, they don't want to be convinced. In 2006, the Egyptian government made an official statement, the stones are not concrete, case officially closed. But a simple statement cannot physically transform the pyramid from concrete to cut stones. Davidovitz provides paleomagnetic analysis results. Every stone in nature at the time of its formation is magnetized by the Earth. That is, each stone has a north, like a compass. All the stones of the pyramid have the same magnetic north, not random. These are chemical analyses carried out under a microscope by Davidovitz. Evidence, but they are not enough to convince the public. Do we have other more convincing evidence? I mean, this is... If this is true, those are good arguments. Those are actually really good arguments. Evidence apart from chemical and x-ray analyses? So here is a natural stone found everywhere in nature, and here is a piece of wood. In nature we always find the wood that grow next to the stone. And here is the proof. And here is a stone that I poured with the formula of Joseph Davidovitz. What? <laughs> what? And before the stone dried, I inserted a piece of wood, and this piece of wood, it will stay stuck indefinitely. In the pyramid of Medum, 70 kilometers below the Giza Plateau and the Great Pyramid, in the heart of the pyramid, there is a stone weighing around two tons. And inside this stone, there is a piece of wood, which it is embedded for eternity. This piece of wood has been there for 4,500 years. But maybe the Egyptians simply dug a hole and inlaid the beam. No, it is not possible because the stone perfectly meets the beam. Between the stone and the wood, there is no mortar. Between the stone and the piece of wood, there is no space, not even to insert a pin. Of course, you not even to insert a pin. Maybe he just has a really big pin. Has he thought about that? Maybe a small pin could enter. Maybe the Egyptians were just so big brain to orient all the stones the same way, the mathematical purity. Yeah, they, they actually tested the ma magnetic alignment of every single stone. This seems like such sim simple shit to actually prove. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you're memeing that I'm beginning to believe, but I'm actually, I'm actually getting convinced here. We went to the Medum Pyramid. The history this is of actually Egypt really plausible. This makes a lot of sense. Huh. Yo, this, oh, this thing looks kind of like coom. Like if someone just coomed all over this rock. Ow, this could be so fucking fake too. The, I mean, this, the, this like documentary. Wow. Like who, who, how do we know where those, those video clips come from? That's the kind of shit you have to think about. But yeah, the wood stuck in concrete is uh, is an interesting one. Anyone Stop can go there, see it, the and touch it. When you know how to pour a stone like concrete, you'll do a second, a third, you'll do tens, hundred thousand, million of blocks, and in so doing, you can build a wood pyramid. The huge stones of the Pyramid of Khafre are made on site with limestone concrete poured into long molds. It is inconceivable to transport this stone. Do you know how many stones of this size there are? Hundreds. It is unimaginable that they were transported and cut. They were cast as well. In the temple of the Valley of Khafre, there are limestone blocks weighing 300 to 400 tons. The Menkor Pyramid Chamber is made of a single block weighing about 600 tons. One can clearly see the location of the construction beams left when the concrete was still fresh. By the way, what is this piece of wood doing in the stone? And the most prodigious of all is the wall surrounding the Pyramid of Khafre. This wall is a perfect 90 degree square made of single blocks weighing 500 to 1000 tons or more. It is eight meters high, six meters wide, and 60 meters long. Two solutions. 
Either the Egyptians cut the hill, but then one needs to show how it was possible to cut a hill to a height of 8 meters. Or the wall is simply poured concrete. This brings us back to Medum. If the Egyptians were able to build a pyramid with concrete, it is therefore logical that they could pour a large wall, like all the other buildings in Egypt. I have Joseph to admit, Davidovitz, this is... helped by 10 participants, poured four blocks weighing two tons in two weeks. When you have a malleable material that hardens quickly, you can make what you want with it. This Pyramids, is actually temples, really plausible. Statues, obelisks, it just depends or on the chemical Indeed, means it is simple. if they're true. You must understand that to build a pyramid 140 meters high, you need a stone on if, if what they said is true about the chemical composition and the magnetic alignment of the crystals inside the stones, etc., etc., that this has to be the best theory we have. On the ground, ironically. with a minimum resistance of 15 megapascals, the ABCs of engineering and architecture. This block has a resistance of 25 to 40 megapascals. So scientifically, this stone can support 500 identical blocks without collapsing. The pyramid being 140 meters high, there is more than enough resistance. After many trials and experiments, the Egyptians had acquired the technique they used for the first pyramid of Djoser, built 180 years earlier. So this movie isn't about aliens or the construction of the pyramid started Sadly, four years no. Ago. But I'm still watching because we're learning stuff. Uh, but this, this is not what I wanted, I, what I expected, rather. I genuinely expected we are so much level. bullshit. The mold for the first cornerstone is in place. Arranged in Indian file, I mean in African file, the workers pass the buckets one after the other, from the mixing tank to the mold. They pour the white concrete and about 30 minutes later the mold is filled. Today we call this process formwork construction. They also needed a unit of measure to properly demarcate the plots. Geometry is good, but after all, you must measure the lines. <laughs> You're giving me lecture vibes by watching this at two times speed, PTSD. I'm so sorry. Um, this was hidden. Wait, is this a conspiracy from Big Egypt? Well, yeah, Big Egypt apparently said that the, the concrete theory was wrong. They considered the king's foot. The length of the king's foot could be used as a standard. This standard would be multiplied and distributed throughout the kingdom. They considered the feet, arms, legs, and elbows of the king, but there was a problem. This unit was not fixed. <laughs> there would be no problem during his reign, but all the kings were not the same size. The next king would surely want to use his foot or his elbow out of pride. In the hills, waiting for the retreat of the Nile, the Egyptians thought and looked for a solution to the problem. This unit of measurement would have to have a fixed length in time, if possible, never change. They observed the size of different plants, fruits, seeds, any object in nature. But all these objects did not have a constant size. For example, if we water a seed well, the following year its size will have changed. And over long distances, small differences quickly became significant. Then, they had the idea to measure water. Yes, Bonger's fresh water from right the now. Nile. Yep. They measured one drop and then another. They were all the same size. From the lower Nile to the upper Nile, the drops were the same size. They noticed that the size of the water drop did not change year after year. It's wonderful. This is not how drops work. No, you can you can make bigger drops and smaller drops. This doesn't make much sense. Come on. I think no Egyptian king had a big penis. Otherwise, we all know what the measuring unit would have been. The Egyptians found a unique unit. The diameter of the drop of water on a waterproof surface, like granite or alabaster, is constant. It measures one centimeter. Today, an incredible video in which you will dive into the heart. No, no, I don't believe this. I I don't believe this. To the first stage of the Serapium project. This is not true. Ula 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 ula. <laughs> ula 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 ula. They named this small unit the royal finger. <laughs> ten drops of water or ten royal cloth. fingers equals one royal hand. One hundred drops of water, so one hundred royal fingers or ten royal hands equals one I, there royal There has leg. to be something to this. Centuries maybe. later, these discoveries were taken out. Hey, remember, of remember when this movie was about telling that Egyptologists were so fucking dumb for imagining pulleys and levers for the rocks look what this guy had right next to him <laughs> he's got a fucking small lever the meter is the most dramatic part here yeah seems over exaggerated um i mean what they're trying to establish here is the re is um an explanation as to why uh why the egyptians had a metric system right pterodong the, uh, amongst the cervixes of this world mine is known as the pterodong oh god Look, a little, a little coom break in, in all this Egyptology. I already talked about like having sex with with the girl and touching her cervix. It's a scary sensation. It's not a. It doesn't. It like makes you wonder if you're gonna hurt her. 
Wait, metric system is invented by the French, no? Uh, officially, yeah. Uh, but uh, officially, but I mean like Western history, yeah. Uh, officially, I don't think uh, Egyptologists recognize that the that Egypt has uh, that the ancient Egypt used the metric system. But if this is if the stuff they're saying is true about how a lot of this um, a lot of the different measurements in the con Egyptian constructions were basically metric then there's no then obviously they use the metric system this water drop stuff needs a ton of proof I it would be easy okay let's re let's reproduce it it's easily reproducible we can we can fact just check this right away okay I'm gonna go get some water all right so I have so I have my water in my cup and now I need a surface uh, let's just use this Oop. I mean, in the sense that they used it, you can't just hypothesize that they did. There has to be proof. I th no, they said that uh, it, a surface that's impermeable to water, like granite, and then they showed it done on a table. So I'm assuming. Wait, I need a, something to measure. Where's my measuring tape? Uh, crap. I don't. I don't actually know where it is. Look at all of Neyman's things on the table. Don't look. Do not. I. I forbid you. Kaka. Wait, where's the kaka? There's no kaka here. Okay, um, alternative solution. I see beer. Maybe. Maybe there is beer. Do not come. Do not. Uh, okay, this phone is out of battery. Uh, I do not have a solution. Okay, I actually need... I need... I need measuring tape. I'm so... Oh, fuck. I just got a splinter in my hand. Uh, I actually need a solution to this problem. I can't measure anything. Do you have any grid paper? No... No, I do not. I have a lighter. Yes, I do. I do actually have a. Uh, I do have a lighter. So many unwashed things on the dining table. Yes, I know. I need to do my uh, dishes. Ah, uh, shit. Oh no, I didn't prepare for this. Use your royal finger. Uh, that's T Monka TOS. My royal finger is for the ladies only and the boys. But you know, not you. Okay. So I put a drop. Can you really even see it? It's here. Yeah, you can't actually see it. Put the fucking board on the table. Yeah, I'm gonna put your put my. Oh, right, there you there you see it. Now the big question is. This is not a centimeter. There is no fucking way this is a cent. This is. Half a. This is not. This is not anything. This is literally nothing. You chucked it instead of letting it drop naturally. True, actually true. I did. I chucked it. You think that's the problem? That probably. Okay. Let's say that's the problem. Let's try again. Wipe this off. Chuck to drop. Invalid. Okay. Here. L look. Let's see. We pick up some water with the tip of the spoon. And it's not enough. Right? It doesn't want to... Oh, there it is. We had a non-chucked drop right there. And it's the same size as the previous one, by the way. Is it the surface, maybe? It could be the surface. It could be the surface is, like, too... too flat. Okay, I'm seeing a little bit over half a centimeter. I'm seeing six millimeters. The previous one was six millimeters as well. Try on a table. You know they use the table. True. Yeah, we can try on the table. This is Senpai, you're making me drip on that big white. Uh-oh. <laughs> Kino, we're doing science. Exactly. Bean-flavored condom? What? I want to see that. Oh, shit, I think it's a bit bigger. It's not a centimeter, though. It's seven millimeters. Okay, dude. I don't know about this. I, I, I'm gonna do one last test. I'm gonna do one last test. Maybe it's the surface. Maybe it's the tool I'm using. Inferior Parisian water makes droplets. Yeah. More like cucklets. I'm gonna use um, a chopstick.
Now this... Now this is a real drop. Oh boy, this is a big one. Wait, I have an idea. Okay, this one's actually 9 millimeters. Approximately. Yeah, this one's actually a centimeter. Okay, so maybe... Maybe the way you always do the same drop is you take a stick of the same... Wait, no, you, but you don't have any way of measuring it. I mean, if you actually want to check, I think the first thing to see is if they produce consistent drops too. Oh, yeah, I, I guess I need to make several drops with this as well. But it seems like the size of the drop depends on how deep I go with the with the stick in the water. So like this one's a centimeter. The previous one was a bit less than a centimeter, but like roughly a centimeter. Now, I guess it's the amount of water where like the drop falls off right away. Huh. I didn't dip it back in. I just uh, saw there was still some water on it and I let it drip off. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this is pretty consistent. It's honestly pretty consistent. It's not perfect, it's not a... But it's pretty darn, pretty damn good. It's better than I expected after the, with doing it with the spoons. So I guess if you're doing it with a stick, it works, it, it kind of does work. Can you find something other that's wooden, other than chopsticks? Mmm, can I find another wooden thing? I, I think those plastic chopsticks are all I have. Let me think about it for a second. I have this, which is a um, scented, like a, some kind of scented wood. Which, by the way... Yeah, it smells really good. It's not even like a round stick. I see a flashlight. There's no flashlights here. It's a centimeter. Now look, this, is, this isn't even round. It's like got a weird shape and all. Me when Neyman talked about StarCraft 2 and said we get him dropping water on this table. As it's, scent, it's scented, isn't it also oiled? No, no, no. This is a wood that naturally has a scent. It's not scented wood that, that was like given a scent. It's, it's wood that naturally has um, a scent to it. Are we ready to accept that the Egyptians had a metric system based on drops of water? Woo, what? Never had heard of such a wood before. Uh, sandalwood has that property. I don't know if this is sandalwood specifically. I don't remember what, what kind of wood it is. But yeah, sandalwood has that. Prove the earth is round now. Uh-oh. Yo, I, the Egyptians are more Gucci than I thought, but I know how trustworthy is this video. Yeah, this is, this is all... Okay, the Egyptians were really good with maths and geometry. That's uh, something that uh, Egyptologists uh, have consensus on that the Egyptians were actually really, really good at this, at this stuff and had a really good understanding of it. What this video is positing that Egyptologists don't usually teach you is that they were using the metric system within all that. That's not, that's the new information added here. But that they understood the um, uh, calculations between the perimeter uh, or, and diameter of a circle and volumes of spheres and stuff like that, that actually is pretty reasonable. They had a good writing system, they had a good understanding of geometry and mathematics. Those were things that they were studying. They wrote it down and thought it was important. So the Egyptians were essentially first semester students. <laughs> yes. Look, when you're studying reality, the, the, uh, is, aren't, aren't we all first semester students? Isn't that the lesson in this? What B Big Egypt doesn't want you to know. Whenever the volume of the cube and the sphere increases proportionally, this number does not vary. In so doing, they discovered one of the most important universal constants, kept secret, the number 52.36. What? Twice in... <laughs> it's a secret? Who keeps it secret? Are, are, is someone going to come and kill me now because I, I'm spreading the secret of 52.36? <laughs> is this... Since when is that a new royal constant? I don't know this enough. Oh no. From then on, all of Egypt would have as a standard a universal constant, the royal cubit. 
the Egyptian royal cubit as presented in museums, 28 fingers or 7 palms, is incomprehensible. Space. It hey, is disguised chill. so that the people do not understand the origin of this cubit. It doesn't matter who disguised the cubit, but when you put it on a meter, it displays 52 centimeters, 30 millimeters, and 6 tenths disguised. of a millimeter. It becomes a universal constant. It takes universal on all its meaning. They invented another measure, half the meter minus five millimeters, called the Babylonian royal cubit. They used these two standards and the meter was deliberately hidden. It is for this what? reason that we find the meter everywhere in the Great Pyramid, since the royal cubit is graduated on the meter. Any other unit, the yard, the inch, the mile, the nautical mile, the pica, the foot, are all arbitrary or graduated on the meter. There is nothing universal or unchanging in nature that measures one inch, one yard, or a mile. Oh my, okay, this like, like they, they managed to get really serious and interesting, but holy shit, this, this stuff actually is brain, yeah, brain rot. I mean, this is some, how, it's secret, so they do a bunch of scuffed cubits to keep it secret, but then they still use it in the pyramids. What kind of... Mental gymnastics is that. Like, Big Egypt wanted to hide the meter, so they... okay. The whole number 8 is divided by pi. What? The result, 2.54, will be graduated to the meter. The Imperial System Unit <laughs> is born. <laughs> <laughs> did you know did you know the imperial system is actually uh, the metric system but with pi <laughs> oh no true and real ba based and based on pi pilled dude big number was trying to hide empirically the egyptians also discovered the golden ratio It's like in animations. <laughs> Big pyramid. The golden red thing. They reasoned thus, since Fractals. the gods use these sacred figures everywhere in nature, in order to remain connected to nature ourselves, we must integrate them into our buildings to do as the gods do. Okay. You have to understand something about the people who go really, really deep into the fucking ratios and pi and the golden the golden ratio and like 52.36 apparently and all this other shit. There are certain basic things in this world that are coherent, okay? Uh, think, ab think about this. The, ga um, the spacing between train tracks across most of Europe is actually based indirectly Wait, wait, no, let's go in one step farther. The size of tanks, the size of tanks in, in, uh, for most European countries is indirectly based on the average width of a horse. You'll say, tell me, that's, that's stupid. That makes no fucking sense. Well, actually, what happens is that the size of the biggest parts of your tank need to be transport, transportable by train. Since we're talking, uh, we're, I'm specifically thinking like World War II. They're, they need to be specifically transportable by train. At that point of the tracks determines how big of a thing you can transport by train. The width of the tracks is based on... Uh, I'm, I'm missing a few steps. I don't remember all of the steps. But basically the width of the tracks is based on uh, something to do with carriages and stuff like that. And eventually you go back to the width of a horse. The, the size of a horse, the size of a human being, those are things that are basically determined by... Um, roughly by the living conditions on this planet. Very based monologue. Thank you. Nice storytelling. Thank you very much. Basically, what I'm saying is that um, you can find connections between numbers very, very easily because things built by humans or even that have to do with living beings that live on the same planet within the same living conditions all will be proportional and related to each other N none of none of that means anything in some like majestic grand magical way it just means that we are fucking living beings that are living at a specific like oxygen level with a specific amount of food that we can consume that determines our sizes and our strength and what we can manipulate and affect and all those things are proportional in in way in like sensible ways that don't need to that don't need any intention to intervene there
that's what what I meant. There is no there is no proof of intentionality just because there's a bunch of ratios between stuff necessarily. The golden horse would argue some kind of heretic. Yes, that's great, but is it true? The uh, I swear the fucking the fucking tanks being based on the size of carriages thing is or indirectly being based on the size of carriages because of the size of trains is something I read about. It, maybe it's false, but I read it and it's I, I remember it being a source I trusted back then. So take it as you will. You you fact check it. Go go ahead. Actually, I would love you to do that. Um, living beings, exactly. Neyman is just on copium because he was wrong about the water droplets. Ancient Egyptians 1, modern Frenchie 0, true. All these numbers are just consequences of themselves. The reason things like the fine structure, constants, C, etc. are important is because of their relevance to physical theories. Absolutely, yeah. I wonder what ancient Egyptian weed was like. Take huge gravity bong grips from the Nile and then do napkin math with the boys. <laughs> Hells yeah. Sounds like an amazing time. Most of Europe, the Soviet anthem starts playing. Yeah, it's just that I don't... There's like different train tracks in different parts of Europe. They, were, they got harmonized at some point but I don't I don't care about it. What was the tank horse thing you referenced? Basically the fact that you, you can have the size of tanks in modern armies being determined by the size of carriages in ancient history, which were in, in their in their turn determined by the sizes of horses. That's and because in the meantime you have uh, do I have a link? No, it's something I read a long time ago. I don't have a link uh, on hand, uh, sadly. Uh, and and the connecting factor there is the size of train tracks, or, or rather the spacing of train tracks being based on carriages, uh, uh, something like that. Are you telling me that the recurring exercise about the ratio of an A4 paper is just meaningless? Rip math application. And math is useful. I'm not saying that. Plural plural of horse is here. <laughs> uh, Neyman is American, French, or Polish, depending on his mood. That is true as well. Yeah, I, I, we we can try to Google it after this. I, I, I want to watch more more of this. Genius. So, can't cite your references, A. Eh? No. The Egyptians will hey, if this video doesn't need to cite its references, I don't, okay? I don't need to while watching this video. Sounds like big horse propaganda. Hey, I would never, never dream of telling you to take ivermectin. No, that, that, that would be big horse propaganda. I, I would not tell you to take ivermectin. The universal Actually, no, the big horse propaganda would be to tell you not to take ivermectin so that the horses have enough ivermectin for themselves. Don't take ivermectin, okay? Don't take ivermectin. Horses need their ivermectin, okay? Constance and I need everywhere. my horse sponsorship. Hi, the golden ratio, the royal cubit, the whole panoply of sacred geometry with the meter. The Egyptians knew the Fibonacci sequence in the golden number thousands of years before him and called it the addition sequence. The Temple of Khafre, the Temple I'm of- I'm pretty sure that's, like, un like, all this stuff is true. Like, what I was saying about there being plenty of, like, Egyptians were pretty based in mathematics. They knew the Fibonacci sequence and stuff like that. I knew it, he's a horsist. He cooks Polish, makes love in French, and, uh, bombs people in American. I don't bomb people. Then I've never bombed Ak anyone. The palaces are built with the golden Chill. rectangle. Here is a parade of the Fibonacci sequence 3,700 years ago. No, those are just rectangles. Those are just rectangles you're sticking on top of. You don't the with a scale. Like, fuck. This is stupid. This is actually stupid. I always make I plot some golden ratio. <laughs> Golden ratio now it's boring, just boring, yeah. Now, to be fair, it's aesthetic. Based. 
You gonna finish this? I don't think so. This is the models, a miniature limestone model of the apartments of the Hawara Pyramid. The construction of this monument absolutely required a careful preliminary plan. The architecture of the pyramid was determined based on a very precise and detailed plan. Everything that was thought of from the start was carried out and scrupulously respected. To build a pyramid, you must choose the shape of the triangle. The question is, what triangle? This is a triangle. This one too. There is a choice from 230,000 triangles and 110 million <laughs> possibilities to make a pyramid. But the Egyptians chose only one. No, there's not 230,000 triangles. There's an infinite, there's an infinite amount of triangles you can make. <laughs> oh no. I copied a screenshot into GIMP to measure it, not close. Wait, no, the, none of those those rectangles are fucking fake. It's a different golden ratio, secret one. Yeah, it's the, the diamond ratio. In ancient Egyptian measurements, the real meter, <laughs> yeah. They opened the valves and let the concrete flow to the bottom of the cavity. Indeed, they fill these natural bowls to then make the underground tunnels. Limestone concrete once dried takes on a natural rock appearance. That's why I, I, think, I think it's amazing how scuffed this documentary is, and it still has some really interesting things, and I feel like we learned a lot. But at the same time, they say the most insane fucking stupid shit. I, I'm thinking, honestly, I think we're, it, it, we're, gonna, we're not going to find anything better here. I, I'm sure there's plenty of memes in here, but I'm starting to get tired of it. I mean, literally three hours of this shit. I know, right? Uh, there's some really good memes in there, but yeah. I'm, I'm, reaching, I'm reaching my limits. I'm done with it.